So as far as um, the athletes you you've worked with, and um, and I, well, and um, maybe before we get into that, um, we were mentioning off off camera sort of so, some of the work that you were doing, and there was uh, there was an argument about. Um, how you had to have carbohydrates to run a sub two hour marathon because you just, just have to, you're just not going to produce that much energy. But mm -hmm. you made the very, very good point when you're actually looking into this, that that wasn't, that wasn't quite true. Can you, can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah. So there's a paper published in the Journal of Applied Physiology about three or four months ago. And the, if I have difficulty pronouncing the guy's name, I think it's Luke Kazovich, something like that. And he, did a, a really good model, but models are not science. They they are a projection. They're not an experiment. They just, you base it on all your assumptions. So I took the article and I said, really, it's really interesting. Let's see if there are any flaws in it. Because he concluded that you couldn't run a sub two hour marathon unless you're eating carbohydrates at 90 to 120 grams per hour. Hmm. That's the finding. You cannot run a sub two hour marathon unless you take in 90 to 120 grams of carbohydrate every hour for two hours. So I went through very carefully his model. And there were there were two errors originally, but they were minor because they blocked they they the one made it worse and the one made it better. But when you took both of them out, it canceled each other out. Hmm. So his model was valid. It's valid. But he made two assumptions that destroy the model. Otherwise, in other words, on the models, he the assumptions he made, fine. But there were two assumptions that unfortunately undermine the, 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 the study. The first one is that you don't burn any fat when you're running a two-hour marathon because you're running at 90% VO2 max. And that's contentious because we've shown you can burn a lot of fat when you're exercising vigorously. But that, but that wasn't. But but he could still say no. But I'm right. Athletes can't burn when they're exercising that vigorously. Fine. Okay, that's your point. Go and study it. But until you've studied it, we we'll accept that. But he went. The one major error was that when you take in carbohydrates, 120 grams per hour. He assumed that 120 grams was being burnt every hour from the from point one. And that doesn't happen because when you take carbs, they take time. It takes about 60 minutes to 90 minutes before you reach these high rates of oxidation. And so you've got this lag phase. And during that lag phase, there's he couldn't, the athletes couldn't burn the amount of carbohydrate he said they needed to run that race. So therefore, his model proves that you can't run a sub two hour marathon on carbohydrates alone. So then when you retweak re the model, it turns out that if they burn a little bit of fat and like, like 7.7 .7 grams a minute, which is not much, you're fine. You can run, you can take a little bit of carbs during the race and you'll be fine. Mm -hmm. So in trying to prove that you carbohydrates are absolutely essential for a sub two hour marathon, he disproved it. Mm -hmm. which is fantastic. He proved you can't do it on carbs. Therefore, you have to do it adapted to, to a higher fat diet. And then it's simple. The, 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 the sums work out very easily. So anyone who tells you, you know, the only reason why the Tour de France cyclists are doing so well is because they're taking 120 grams of carbs an hour. Mm -hmm. I can tell you that's just the way to diabetes. That's where mm -hmm. they're going in the long term. Yeah. And, and some of these, um, studies where they did have the the high carb arm and the low carb arm some of the high carb arms they actually were giving these people showing up that they were getting into like pre-diabetic ranges weren't they that's right yeah that's right there was a, that you're quite right there's a lovely there was an ultra mar i think the iron man winner two or three years ago he said he showed his blood glucose curves because he had a monitor on mm -hmm. and they were all in the diabetic range for the whole race he said yeah. I'm not going to get hypoglycemia. I know you're not because you're going to get diabetes. Yeah, that's but, not the but problem. Let me tell you what, what I've learned in, in this study. This is that there are these two pools of glucose in the body. The one is the liver and the blood glucose, and the other is the muscle glycogen. And they serve totally different functions. No one tells you that. You know, just take the carbs. You need the carbs. No, no, no. There are two different control mechanisms. 
And the first mechanism, which is the important one, is that the body regulates the blood glucose concentration. So anytime you take in glucose, and particularly even during exercise, the body's first response is get rid of the glucose out of the bloodstream, burn it or store it. That's the rule. It's nothing, it's nothing to do with, oh, it's unneeded for the fuel in my muscles. That's not what's going on. The body says, this is a catastrophe. You've got to keep the blood glucose normal. And it's my, my impression and belief now, having read so much, that the reason why you have muscle glycogen is simply to store the excess glucose. Mm. So you dump the glucose. So when you're eating a high carbohydrate diet, because remember, we were carnivores for millions of years. We don't have the capacity to store much glycogen. We have to glucose or, and to, to keep the blood glucose normal. We just got to dump that glucose out of there and into the muscles. And then what happens is the moment you start exercising, you're going to burn that stuff because the body says, I've got to get rid of that rubbish that's in the muscles. Get rid of it. Because this guy's, I know, in an hour or in six hours' time, he's going to have another carbohydrate meal. And I want to store that carbohydrate. So that's how I see muscle glycogen. I see it as a, simply as a reservoir for the excess glucose in the bloodstream. It, it serves no other particular function. Whereas the glucose in the bloodstream has a vital role because if your blood glucose falls, you, you can damage your brain. So that's got to be, that becomes the priority in, meta, in human metabolism. The number one priority is keep the blood glucose flat. That's the number one priority. Yeah. And, and so it's very clear that when you take glucose, the body wants to get it out of the bloodstream as soon as it possibly can. Mm. And when you've got lots of muscle glycogen, the body wants to get rid of that. Now, what's really interesting, when you go one step further, the muscle glycogen controls its own metabolism, which is really the rate at which it's being metabolized. And it does that through insulin. So if, you're, if you start exercise with a high muscle glycogen, the insulin is high, and that inhibits fat oxidation. And as a consequence, you have to burn the glycogen, and that's the body's design. You're going to burn that glycogen first. If, on the other hand, you start with little muscle glycogen, your insulin is low and your fat oxidation is much increased. And so you burn fat. And that's how the system works. But so again, I'm emphasizing that there are two pools of glucose and they're totally differently regulated. And people think, well, that you just take glucose and it goes and it's distributed equally throughout the body. And that's simply not the case. But, but the key point that, that I've emphasized is muscle glycogen regulates its own use. Now, why would that be? Why would that be? And why would muscle glycogen not break down to glucose, which then gets into the bloodstream? You think you're storing all this glycogen, and you, you, where you need, you need the glucose in the bloodstream. That's what you want to protect. Why doesn't the muscle release glucose? It's designed not to, because that would interfere with your blood glucose regulation. So the blood glucose regulation is fixed on the liver. That's the controls. And the muscle glycogen is a completely different control mechanism. And what I've given you is a, is a very simple observation of how it goes. But, but no one has ever said that that's what's happening, in, in, at least in, in the physiology science, in the sports sciences. Yeah. It's all about take as much carbohydrate so you can fill your muscle glycogen. Actually, you're filling it. Because it's trying, you're trying not to kill yourself. The body's yeah. saying, don't kill me with all this glucose. Yeah. Yeah, that's all, that was what I, I thought as well. You know, the high, high blood sugar, I mean, this is what kills diabetics. You know, every, everybody knows that. Or certainly every yeah. doctor should know that. And then so your body recognizes this as, um, uh, you know, this, uh, again, a mutual friend of ours, Gary Fe uh, Dr. Gary Fecky said um, that, that above a certain level of glucose in the, in the blood, it's toxic. It's a toxic dose to the body and your body responds to it as a toxin by trying to detoxify it and raising insulin to force this out. And that's what it does. It gets shoved in by, you know, into glycogen in your muscles, in your uh, liver, uh, turns into fat. And also intramuscular fat, so myosteatosis, which we when we look at MRIs, we we see this as pathological. We see, especially in in uh, spinal surgery, this is something we've seen strong correlations with back pain and poor outcomes with spinal surgery is myosteatosis in the paraspinal muscles. That's something that we've actually long seen. That this is the that if you have someone with um, myosteatosis in those muscles would be like. They're probably going to have a bad outcome, even if you fix the defect and the uh, yeah. and the compression. So, 
this is something that's pathological. We're putting ourselves into a pathological state, and yet we're thinking that this somehow gives us super magic powers when it comes to athletics, and that no, not only does it give us a better outcome, it's the only way we can get an outcome. It's the only way you can perform as an athlete. Even though we've been high-performance athletes as carnivores, hunting mammoths and and being endurance hunters and chasing down uh, animals until they just get too tired and lay down and you just go up to them and, and take them out. They still do that here in Australia. I have a friend of mine who just got sick of uh, working in the, in the normal, <laughs> normal life and just said, yep, I'm going out. And he just started living out in the bush and um, very interesting guy, um, uh, Adam Cavanaugh, I interviewed him and he, you know, lives with these um, rural Aboriginal uh, native Australians. That's how they hunt. They just yeah, chase exactly. down a kangaroo or something and just keep running yeah, them down. Exactly. He says they only make it about a kilometer, and then they're just so they're exactly. so yeah hot and overheated and and that's it. Yeah. It's, um, so we've been high performance athletes for a long time. There was a um, fossil record in the clay. It was a sort of clay beds. It was still wet at the time, and they found these footprints. They're I don't know something like twenty thirty thousand years old of native Australians. And they were obviously chasing something and they were sprinting mm. and they looked at the, at the stride length. And some of these guys were, were going, you know, faster than Hussein Bolt, you know, it was just yeah. absolutely Amazing. flying. Yeah. And so, and these were just normal guys. They weren't training for, you know, the, the, uh, the oh. Olympics or anything like that. They were just hunting. And so how is it possible that we've been such high performance athletes who were able to take down animals that, that uh, outclassed us by every physical metric. We talk about the megafauna and things like that. That's, you know, that takes some serious doing to take something like that down. And we were doing it for millions of years. So how are, how are we not anything except these amazing athletes on a zero carb diet? How are we not designed for that? It doesn't make sense to me. So Western Price, who obviously you know all about, when he traveled around the world and looked at the original diets of the, these people mm -hmm. who hadn't changed their diet, he said the Australian Aborigines mm -hmm. and the Plains Indians were the most beautiful people he'd ever seen, mm -hmm. and they were the most healthy people. But as soon as they started eating the industrial diet, of course, their health went went much worse. Mm. Yeah, there was um, there was a paper in two thousand. 2001 that came out and they talked about like the, there was some some work that was done by some anthropologists in the late 1800s with the Plains Indians in America and they found that they were you know different tribes were sort of different heights but they found that these were on average the tallest human beings on earth and uh, I believe it was the Cheyenne the adult male height was about five foot ten that was on average and this was much higher and taller than the rest of the world the very interesting thing about this is some people look at that and like, well, you know, that's sure that's tall for an average, but it's not like crazy yeah. tall compared to today's figures. The interesting thing was that this was after they were put on the reservations and had, uh -huh. didn't have access to their traditional diet. They had already started to become westernized and they had and already started course, having their, course, their diet corrupted. And so in, yeah. in their work and in his work, they even said um, that they that speaking to them they say we were normally much taller we're shorter now and so he was saying yeah. wow you guys are so tall and he's saying mm, you you have no idea we're normally much taller than this uh we've actually we've actually gone down and it was theorized that if they checked this 100 years earlier probably would have been much higher some of the paintings yeah. from the late 1700s uh and the, the scale that they found, they found that these the a lot of these people from the Great Plains were, were probably pushing seven feet tall. They're very, very tall. Um, Thomas yeah. Jefferson, when he was president, some of them came out to see him and and to to meet him as deli as uh, diplomats. And he was six two, six two and a half. So he's not a short guy, especially for the time. And he said that they were absolute giants. That these guys are mm. towered over him; that they were absolutely huge, and um, you know they're just living, living a normal life. There's um, there's a book uh, about the the native Australians in the 1800s. I think it's called Kings in Grass Houses, and they talk about how actually they were actually very tall. They talk about a number of these people who were just basically these gentle giants or extremely tall. Yeah. And there was yeah. an assassination in the 1800s. Some you know British. Uh, you know, official got killed and they they really took it out on the on the rural communities, unfortunately, and they killed a lot of people. 
And um, unfortunately, this gentle giant in the in the story got killed. And when they people came after and looked at the you know the, the bones that were just sort of strewn about, and they're sort of uncovered by the the sands, they found that that some of these skeletons were just on a, just a different scale. And then yeah. the some of these the forearms, just the ulna and the radius, were longer than the entire outstretched arms of the British soldiers. They were that big, yeah. just absolute giants. Yeah. And now they are not. Now they are much shorter, and 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 much less healthy. And that, that's the main thing, of yeah. course. Um, obviously, the average height of a population denotes the average health of a population. And now the health of the population of the native Australians is, is much is much eroded. When I first came to Australia, I was told day one that when you see a, a, a native Australian patient, whatever it says on their chart, add 20 years to their age because they just age so much more quickly and they degenerate so much more quickly. And so you have someone in their 30s, you have to consider them in it as a geriatric in the geriatric population because they just get these diseases so much more quickly. It's actually quite sad. Yeah. Very much so. Yeah. No, that's very interesting. Thank you for that information. Yeah. Most interesting. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, I love that sort of thing that, you know, the, the, the connections with anthropology and, um, and our, you know, and, and our living biology and, and how much this affects us.